Hello and welcome to the video for Monday, November 2nd. This is After Effects. I'm gonna let you guys in from the waiting room. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm gonna have to like turn the camera on. Hey, there you are, Spike. <laughs> How's it going? Did you have a nice Halloween? Yeah, it's been pretty good. Um, yeah. Sorry if I'm distracted. Uh, my cat's like on top of my keyboard. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a cute cat. What's his name? What's your cat's name, Spike? Oh, uh, Kitty. Kitty, all right. <laughs> good name. <laughs> How you guys doing? Did you have a good good weekend? Good Halloween? Not too bad. Yeah. Anybody dress up for Halloween or go hang out with some friends? Anything like that? I spent it uh, playing Don't Starve with a friend. So that was oh yeah. Yeah. That sounds fun. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird, uh, weird holiday season with the virus and everything. Uh, are any of you guys changing any of your holiday plans from, uh, because of the virus? Like you're not going to get together with family members or are you still going to go ahead and do that kind of thing? No, it hasn't changed our, our, our view about getting together with family. Um, we're, we're still getting together. Um, it, it's not really affected us like that, but that's good. Let's see. Joe, Joey says he had a great Halloween doing homework. Wow. That sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> how we envy you, Joey. Um, yeah, I've had other students who said they had to work all Halloween. So that's no fun. Let's see. Gabe, Gabe said he had a quiet Halloween. We usually get about 60 plus trick or treaters and the streets were like a deserted town. Oh yeah, no holiday get togethers for us for sure on our end, virtual or phone only. Yeah. Yeah, you're not alone in that. There's a lot of people, especially since the incidents of COVID are on the rise. Uh, a lot of people aren't, you know, necessarily doing the whole big family uh, holiday Thanksgiving thing today, this year. Maybe they'll do like a Zoom Thanksgiving and, you know, just, just congregate in smaller groups, like with people they live with and such. Um, so Rachel says she's changing hers. She usually travels, but definitely not this year. Yeah, I hear you. The, the idea of getting on a plane is kind of scary in the enclosed cabin, even though they've done some experiments, <laughs> which we don't know if they were funded by the uh, airline industry or not, but uh, you know, that say that because the air is purified and stuff uh, on the airplane that you might be safe, but it is still pretty scary to think about getting on a plane this time of the year and traveling. Uh, but hopefully you guys found a way to have fun this weekend and you'll have fun on your other uh, holidays upcoming. So let me, um, let me go ahead and put you guys into the attendance and then we will get started. Okay, so After Effects. All right. And don't tell me, don't tell me, Rodney. Okay. All right. I think we're good. Um, so just want to give you guys a heads up on the presentation schedule for this week. So I have uh, Laura listed as today and Rodney on uh, Wednesday. So um, Laura, did you have a chance to put a, a presentation together? Yes, it's in my folder. It's in your folder? Yeah. All right, let me see if I can get there real quick. Um, okay, so I wanna go to- If you want, I can present the presentation. Okay, um, I mean, would you would you rather present it? Mm, yes, please. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, that's not a problem. So I'm gonna make it so you can share the screen. Okay. Um, so it's all yours, Laura, if you wanna take it away. Okay.
Oops, wait. Wait. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> yeah, we can see. Yeah, I can see it just fine. Okay. Wait. Okay, so um I did my presentation on the history of animation because I don't know if you know about about it, so I just wanted to do it. So I think you already know um, the meaning of animation, but I wanted to talk about it. So basically animation in, con consists in figures that are manipulated to appear as moving images. I found that animation comes from a Latin word that basically translates this. I don't know how to pronounce that, but I think it's bestowing of life or lifeliness. Um, it is known that before the introduction of true animation, people liked the shows with moving figures that were created manually. So an example is puppetry and, how do you pronounce that word? Automata or? Yeah, automata. Okay, <laughs> that word. And and wait and shadow play. The um, the stroboscopic <laughs> was introduced introduced the principle of modern animation. It was considered the first animation, and it works with sequential images that are shown one by one quickly. So as you can see the image and this creates an optical illusion of motion pictures and it was in i'm having trouble hearing uh so laura it was a little bit of lag too La laura are you uh are you still able to talk? Laura? Uh, I think her audio dropped out for some reason. Um, I know she's had trouble in the past with like sketchy internet. Yeah, it says, yeah, her mic went out or something. Uh, oh, that something there. happened. Yeah, disconnected. So I predict that she'll be back in a sec. Oh, maybe um, maybe I can bring up her, her video and then she can just talk about it. Let me see. Yeah. Is that, would that work for you, Laura? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I, I so, know it, it's, it's hard to, to make this work when you have a sketchy um, internet. Mm. Okay, so let me bring up. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, okay, so here is the history of animation presentation. I'm just opening it up and then I'll, I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, so then we're going to present it. Ahead a couple slides. So we'll go to the next one. Next one. Shadow play. Okay. All right. So now let's see. I just have to share my screen. Share screen. Okay. So Laura, you just need to tell me when to go to the next slide. Okay. So uh, should I go to the next slide? Yes, please. Okay. Um, the next one. <laughs> the next one after this? Yeah. Right here. Yeah. 
So I was talking about um, that animation of yeah. commercialized um, years later. That example here is called the Phantasmagory. And it is the old yes. example of what we know as traditional animation that are basically hand drawing. Next, please. Mm. During the 1910s, the production of cartoons became an industry in the US. So um, John Randolph Bray and Earl Hart, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but um, they patented the cell animation process that basically was used for the rest of the century. And one example is um, Felix the Cat. I don't know if you know about it. And here's an example of cell animation. I don't know if you can see that they have different um, like sheets or with number, numbering the sheets that needs um, the drawing to move, basically. Um, next. And that's an example of what serial animation basically is. Um, next. Um, the golden age basically is when the US, during that time, the US um, produced many animations internationally. So basically in 1928, I don't know if you remember this animation. It is called the Steamboat Willie with Mickey and Minnie. And the, this animation became popular and put Walt Disney Studio at the top of the animation industry. And I found that Disney um, introduced color in animations in 1932 and different animations were produced during that time, um, like um, Looney Tunes, Superman, Pink Panther, Tom and Jerry, Casper, and well, more. <laughs> Next, please. So you can see, yeah, I was talking about that. Next. And after that, the animation on TV, animation became very popular in TV since the 1950s. Um, basically, animations were mainly programmed for children and the production of new cartoons started to shift from theatrical releases to TV series because of the demand that people wanted to keep watching animations. And one of the most famous animations at that time was um, the Flintstones, Scooby-Doo, the Smarts, and the Simpsons. Next. And, well, finally, and the computer animation. Well, many cell studios uh, changed to producing mostly computer animated films. And in, well, basically, some studios, some studios started to use the computer animation in the 1990s because it was cheaper and pretty, how do you pronounce that? Uh, profitable. Yeah, that word. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And basically the first computer animated film in 3D style was Toy Story. I don't know if you know that. Next. And some fun facts. Um, I found that the absence of the fifth finger helped animation studios to save millions of dollars. I don't know if you, I mean, the Simpsons have just four fingers. So basically the absence of the, absence of the, the fifth finger made um, animation studios save millions of dollars. Next. And the last one is that 
Tangle is one of the most expensive films in the world. And it took six years because of her hair, basically. Because it needed a um, special program for that to look realistic. And that's it. All right. Woo nice job. That was cool. I learned some, some cool things. I didn't really I didn't really know. Uh, it makes sense that there was that shift from uh, theaters to television for animation, but I didn't really know when that occurred. So it was nice to see that slide in there. So thank you, Laura. That was a good job. Thank you. I love animation. It's so much fun. Um, OK, so um, what I want to do today was talk to you guys a little bit more about this project we're working on, um, which is, you know, uh, avant-garde or abstract film project, right? Um, let me go ahead and bring up my chat here so I can see what you guys are saying. Uh, let's see. So Gabe said, wow, that was a great presentation. Really cool stuff I didn't know about. Love rabbit duck season episode. Never noticed the fifth finger missing before either. And uh, Scooby said, nice work. Um, yeah, and by the way, Scooby, some of the most amazing background paintings that I've seen in animation were done for Scooby-Doo. I just cannot believe the quality of the background paintings. They had some awesome people working for them back then. Um, but uh, yeah, and of course, uh, watching those movies as a, as a kid was, was always fun, those cartoons. Um, and Alex says, nice job as well. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Um, what I wanted to do today was talk about the, uh, you know, the project we're working on and give you guys some more points of reference. Um, so first of all, I want to start by going to this little, there's a little chat here. Uh, and there's this guy whose nickname is Prometheus, who maybe he went to film school. I don't know, maybe he or she went to film school. But um, he gives this definition of, uh, let's see, ah of abstract. And I thought it was interesting because, you know, when, when we talked about the idea for this project, we said, oh, let's, you know, we decided on an abstract project, but it turns out that just like an abstract, you know, visual art, you know, like paintings that in film, uh, there are all of these different subgenres, you know, some of which are called abstract, some of which are called surrealism, some are avant-garde, some are non-narrative. And so, he gave, gives a little bit of a, a clue to that in his definition here. He says, because they're talking about abstract. And he says, I think you're getting confused between abstract and non-narrative. Non-narrative means it doesn't have a plot. And that's what surre surrealist films usually are. Okay, so of course, we saw some examples of non-narrative film where, you know, like uh, a bunch of students were, you know, being filmed and then they showed a door and then there was text that said, you know, uh, he's at the door, open the door, whatever the heck it said. So that's kind of a non-narrative um, in that it doesn't have a plot. And another, another genre of this type of film is surrealist, which you know is even a little more strange, right? Um, now it says abstract means that not only, not only is there no plot, but there are no recognizable objects. So if we wanted to get really you know, fine tuning with definitions here, Abstract would just be like those examples I showed you last week, which were just the animated blobs and shape like this example here. Um, so it says an abstract film has no actors and no things and thus is mostly limited to animation. An abstract film isn't really supposed to be meaningful. Its value is strictly aesthetic. An example of an abstract, abstract film is this. Let's see if this thing plays or not. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, let me say once again that even though we name this the abstract project, that doesn't mean that you have to go ahead and do an animation that just uses blobs and weird shapes. Because apparently what happened was, you know, we thought about doing a project that was kind of abstract, but the terminology we had was not exact enough to describe the types of things you guys can do. And 
you know, just to reiterate, you guys have sort of an open um, open options here. You can really do anything that um, that in your mind means abstract, but we're also learning about the definitions of these different things. So really, the definition of abstract is that, you know, it's something that is it's not recognizable objects, right? Then there's non-narrative, which means there's not a, a sort of a, a, a regular plot line to follow. Um, and of course, surrealist, which is, you know, sort of, uh, more strange and and sometimes disturbing, right? Um, and then it says, or something filmed with a camera might look like this. So, so we had abstract art that was just animations, and then here's a version of abstract art that is just filmed. Let me make this bigger since it's so such a sort of weird series of things. Okay, I think we get the idea. We could spend another minute uh, on this, but I think it's just, you know, pretty obvious what it is. It's just filmed version of abstraction, right? Now then it says here, surrealist film, on the other hand, uses the juxtaposition of familiar objects in unexpected ways, along with subconscious symbolism to communicate meaning in the absence of sense. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, whatever our example here, it got pulled by YouTube. Uh, it says either way, I don't think you should consider it a trap to make something pointless. The only purposes fine art needs to save are the enjoyment of the viewer and or the personal expression of the creator, right? So, um, you know, once again, your your abstract uh, your abstract video that you might make, whether it's you know animated blobs or an, animate you know real world sort of unrecognizable objects that fall into the abstract sense, sort of surrealist, which is real world objects that are placed sort of out out of context with each other, but but that can have some kind of a a meaning, uh, or even you know uh, or, you know non narrative, uh, which is just you know of basically a film that doesn't have a, a set narrative structure, you know, whatever it is that you want to do is fine. And it's good for us to define these things so we can talk about. Um, okay, uh, now along those lines, so maybe a law, a big sort of general definition of all this is experimental film, okay? Um, and what we have is a couple of different articles here to look at today. Um, one of them is about surrealism, and maybe we'll watch that one first since we're just talking about surrealism, and it's called Surrealism and D David Lynch. So we actually have, we have one article and then two, um, two videos. Actually, I think I wanna talk about the, uh, the article first and then go to the video. So let me go uh, to this one called Why You Should Be Making Experimental Film. Now this is by, this is an article on a website called No Film School, and they've got a bunch of interesting articles if you wanna check them out. But um, so they first say, you know, what is experimental filmmaking? Let me make this bigger so it's easier for us to see it. It says it's difficult to find, to define, uh, not because its guidelines are so abstract or even esoteric, but because it's such a wide ranging genre that defining it almost defeats the purpose of the genre itself. In one sense, it refers to anything that def defies the conventions of traditional narrative and documentary cinema. It doesn't have to tell a story. Um, there, there don't have to be characters. There doesn't even necessarily need to be a message of any kind. It can be visceral or mundane, engaging or a complete bore. It can be highly personal or overtly political. It can be literally anything. Okay, so that's a definition of um, you know, experimental film. On the other hand, experimental film is an aesthetic and oral art form. Film inherently takes some of the most expressive elements from other artistic mediums and combines them into a magnificent smorgasbord of sight and sound. All films have elements of photography, music, painting, dance, etc. However, narrative and documentary films don't necessarily use all of these artistic elements to their full potential. They're more focused on creating an enhanced sense of narrative reality than creating pure aesthetic art. With experimental films, however, the extent to which these elements can be mixed and manipulated to evoke or portray emotion or ideology is infinite. Okay, uh, as a result, experimental filmmaking is an absurdly powerful artistic medium that can be matched by few, 
if any other art forms in terms of pure expressionistic potential. If there's not reason enough, to, if that's not reason enough to get started with this fantastic genre, here are a few more of its copious benefits. Okay, so one of them is, I'm gonna skip down here, creative freedom. First and foremost, this type of filmmaking is one of the most creatively freeing things that a person can do. Narrative film, filmmaking, like it or not, is all about restraint in what you show and how you show it. Even the narrative films that break away from convention are subject to the idea that every image and every sound needs to be in service of the story and the characters. With experimental filmmaking, however, you're free to throw any and all restraint to the wind and make creative decisions that would be unacceptable in the world of narrative film. You can express emotions, ideas, concepts, and literally anything else through literal or abstract imagery, through juxta juxtapositional editing, through creative use of sound design. You can disregard the technical and focus solely on the creative. Okay, here's another plus, spontaneity. In narrative filmmaking, it's difficult to be truly spontaneous. When time is money, which is always which it always is in a narrative environment, people tend to stick to the schedule and get the shots they need to tell the story. This isn't a bad thing in the slightest, but it's not conducive to creating art, which requires at least a certain amount of spontaneity. With experimental filmmaking, creative decisions can be well thought out choices made prior to shooting, or the shooting could be a spontaneous act of expression in and of itself. When you're not burdened with schedules and shot lists and the AD isn't hassling you to get the next shot set up, you are free to make creative decisions as you see fit right on the spot. Okay, here's a still frame from Night Music by Stan Brockage. It's a pretty cool uh, frame there. Personal expression. Narrative filmmaking by its very nature is a collaborative craft. In order for narrative films to be made properly, it takes dozens if not hundreds of individuals, each with a specific role in the production of that piece. Even though we still promote the idea of the auteur in our current filmmaking climate, pure personal expression is nearly impossible in an environment where hundreds of unique voices coexist. Don't get me wrong, creative collaboration is a fantastic thing and it's the best way to make narrative films, but it can be detrimental to the idea of the personal art. Experimental filmmaking, however, offers filmmakers the ability to express whatever the hell they want in any way they want. Your cat just died and you're all torn up inside? Make a film about it. Girlfriend dumped you for a guy named Chad? Ooh, Chad, uh, make a film about it. The point is that making films like these can be both cathartic and productive. And oftentimes the process of making the film can help you resolve or at least gain perspective about whatever issues you might be going through. <laughs> I like Jacob's comment here. It's always freaking Chad, yeah. Wouldn't that be funny if there was like a rule, just like a, a universal rule that the only guy that could take your girlfriend is a guy named Chad? Then what we would do is we would lock up all the chats and we'd all be we'd all be okay. Okay, a few more positives here. Social expression. There's another um, still frame. This is from Abstractions of the Night by Robert Hardy. Okay, social expression. Uh, a good many narrative films have cultural, social, political, religious undertones implicitly stated through narrative conventions. However, when tremendous amounts of money are on the line, investors and EPs tend not to want their finished films to be political or religious statements due to the fact that these types of films alienate audiences, which is the last thing you wanna do in the pursuit of making a commercially successful film. Um, just like the previous section, experimental filmmaking allows you to focus your creative efforts squarely on the statement that you're trying to make with your film without any of the back and forth politics that come with narrative filmmaking. If you wanna make films about your displeasure with the US Congress, um, wow, what a time to talk about that, right? Then you can make the most scathing critiques known to man. That's your prerogative as an experimental filmmaker. Okay, here's another uh, reason, creative betterment. With experimental filmmaking, anything and everything is possible. You can try things with a camera that you would never think to do on a narrative set. In the editing room, you can stack, manipulate, and composite video to your heart's content. You can create the most mundane or insanely abstract images and sounds and rearrange them in any way you see fit. When you have no creative restrictions, you're more likely to try new things and well, experiment. It's through this experimentation that you can begin to bolster your creative tool set and create and master techniques that you may be able to incorporate into your narrative and documentary films, okay? There's another su uh, super cool still frame. This one from Birthright by Robert Hardy. Okay, defining a unique cinematic voice. It might seem fairly cyn cynical of me to say this, but most narrative films these days are all strikingly similar to one another in terms of their style and what they offer the audience in an artistic sense. Most of us grow up watching and studying the same films, 
And when it comes time to make our own, we draw from the same cinematic vocabulary that most other filmmakers are using. The result is relative conformity. Uh, in my opinion, that's what makes filmmaker, filmmakers such as Steve McQueen so successful and prevalent today. As someone with a background in fine art and video installation art, McQueen has forged a unique style and perspective that has allowed him to take the narrative filmmaking world by storm with his three features. No one is making films like McQueen, and that can be at least partly attributed to his early career as an experimental filmmaker and artist. Okay, so here is an official trailer for a film called Hunger by Steve McQueen. Uh, let's check it out. such thing as political murder, political bombing, or political violence. There is only criminal murder, criminal bombing, and criminal violence. We will not compromise on this. You notice a lot of the still frames uh, that, that went by that they look like paintings, they look like pictures, you know, a little one of a note or some birds flying out of trees. And you know, the director definitely has a really uh, very artistic eye. In the same vein as McQueen, uh, you can begin to develop your own unique cinematic voice through an exploration of and involvement in experimental filmmaking. There are no wrong answers. In the world of narrative and documentary cinema, there are definite guidelines as to what constitutes a good or bad film. Whether or not a film is good or not all depends on the writing, the directing, the acting, the cinematography, the editing, the sound, and so on. With experimental cinema, however, these restraints can be tossed out the window because expression is the primary purpose, not technical perfection. This might sound like a cop-out, and to a certain extent it is. With that said, just because the primary goal of this type of expression doesn't mean that we should be sloppy in the technical aspect of making these films. However, technical knowledge isn't a prerequisite for experimental filmmaking. There are no major barriers to speak of. You don't necessarily need a camera or in-depth knowledge of After Effects. Well, of course, knowledge of After Effects will help, right? Uh, the only thing you really need to get started is an inherent desire to create and express yourself. So conclusion, experimental filmmaking is a world all its own, and it's one that is often overlooked by the majority of filmmakers these days. It certainly shouldn't be, though. It's a unique and powerful art form that provides countless benefits beyond the fact that it allows us to be artists in the truest sense of the word. In order to get you guys even more stoked about making experimental films, here's one of the greatest of all time, Maya Darren's Meshes of the Afternoon. Okay, video no longer available, unfortunately. Um, so maybe that's one you guys can look up, uh, Maya Darren's Meshes of the Afternoon. Um, okay, so uh, pretty interesting article, uh, points out a lot of benefits to experimental film. Uh, you know, one of the clearest ones uh, that I can think of is if you want to be a narrative filmmaker, you know, experimentation is, is your playground and you can go out and shoot experimental films. And then some of the techniques you come up with, you can you can bring back to your narrative filmmaking. OK, so now we have a couple of videos to watch. Uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, this beginner's guide to experimental uh, cinema. Okay, let's see. Sorry, we're going to have some. McSally's attacks on. We're going to have some ads here, which I'm going to uh, uh, mute. When work can happen anywhere, why not take it somewhere where the workday doesn't just end? In Sorry, another ad. Let me skip this one. 
For those just starting to dive into the world of cinema, experimental film can seem daunting and impenetrable. It can also be difficult to even get what makes something an experimental work, as there's no clear definition for what qualifies and what doesn't. The line between experimental film and what's referred to as art house cinema is unclear. Art house films are much less commercial than mainstream movies and often only play in independent theaters. These include the work of directors like Akira Kurosawa, Jean Luc Godard, and Ingmar Bergman. Art house films definitely have experimental elements, but they won't be the focus of this video. Instead, I'll be discussing films that are more undeniably experimental in nature. Often these films don't really tell a traditional narrative and lack things like dialogue, characters, or plots. One might assume that all experimental films are boring and pretentious, and while there are certainly plenty of cases where this is true, there are just as many where it isn't. Experimental films were being made from cinema's infancy, and major works started coming in the 1920s and 30s with the rise of surrealism as an art movement. In the 40s and 50s, the scene grew even further with the increased availability of filmmaking equipment and production programs at universities. The rise of film festivals helped even more, as did the counterculture of the 60s and 70s. And of course, with the low cost of digital video, now pretty much anyone who wants to can make an experimental film. In my opinion, the best place to start is with the greatest experimental film ever made, Koyana Skatsi from 1982. Director Godfrey Reggio's film is quite clearly experimental cinema, as it has no dialogue, characters, or plot. We don't even get narration or text giving any sort of context to the images. Koyana Skatsi is basically a 90-minute music video, since the only sound the viewer hears is the brilliant music from one of the top composers of the 20th century, Philip Glass. The film is worth watching for the score alone, and it was the first of many amazing movie soundtracks from Glass. The music is fundamental to Koyana Skatsi as it plays from beginning to end, and it was even drastically re-edited during production to go with Glass's score. Director of photography Ron Fricke provides beautiful imagery of nature, cityscapes, vehicles, people, and more. One of the central parts of the film's look is the extensive use of time-lapse photography. While sped-up footage of a cityscape is now commonplace and even cliché, at the time it was revolutionary. Time-lapse had been used before, but this was the first time the technique was used in such an extensive and significant way. It led to time-lapse becoming used quite often, especially in music videos. Like many experimental films, Koyana Skatsi blurs the line between documentary and narrative. There are no actors, and the shots depict reality, but when taken as a whole, the film becomes something more than a documentary. If you like Koyana Skatsi, it's actually the first in a trilogy, something very rare among experimental cinema. The sequel, Pawakatsi, came out in 1988, and Reggio, Glass, and Fricky all returned. It takes the same basic formula as the first film, but has more of a focus on the third world and developing nations. Pawakatsi isn't nearly as influential or essential as the original, but there's definitely some cool stuff in there and it's worth giving a chance. It also has yet another memorable score from Philip Glass. The trilogy concluded in 2002 with Nakoi Katsi, which is the least well-regarded and substantially different from the first two films. The biggest differences are that it uses mostly stock or archive footage and it features computer-generated imagery. It's much less of a documentary, and the CGI does look dated and cheesy at times. The pre-existing footage is often heavily altered and occasionally borders on abstraction. Ron Fricke did not work on Nikoi Katsi, but he's directed some powerful and interesting films on his own that are also relatively accessible, starting with his debut Kronos in 1985. Named after the ancient Greek word for time, the 42-minute long film is a meditation on the passage of time. It's similar to Kuyana Skatsi due to its lack of dialogue or plot, and a score that's always playing, but it's less concerned with conveying a message to the audience. His first feature came in 1992 with Baraka. It feels less like an extended music video than the Katsi films, since the music isn't constantly present and we hear on-screen sounds like waterfalls and animals. It does have a similar visual style, though, since it has time-lapse footage and people staring into the camera. His most recent effort, Samsara, from 2011, is in my opinion his best yet. It's also the weirdest film from Reggio or Fricky, as well as the most disturbing, 
seeing as it has some unpleasant footage of animal cruelty and an extended sequence that shows you how meat gets made. If you want to check it out, Samsara is available on Amazon Prime. Another exceedingly consequential experimental film is Unshin Andalu from 1929. It's good for beginners partly due to its short length of 21 minutes, and you can watch it for free on YouTube. It also has the hook of being co-directed by one of the most well-known artists in history, surrealist Salvador Dali. Like his art, the short is quite surreal and ignores any sort of logic throughout. Unlike the work of Reggio and Fricky, Unshen Andalu does have characters and dialogue. Its experimental nature comes from the fact that scenes don't have any clear connections and the events we see are either impossible or absurd. Dali's co-director was the Spanish-born Louis Buñuel, who went on to become a legendary standard bearer of surrealism in cinema. The short film gives us plenty of unique imagery, most notably the iconic shot of an eyeball being sliced as a cloud passes over the moon. Dali and Boonwell's film came during a significant movement of avant-garde filmmakers in the 1920s and 30s that were either a part of the surrealist or Dada art movements or strongly influenced by them. Many of these are suitable for newcomers to experimental cinema due to being mostly pretty short and visually appealing. Marcel Duchamp was one of the most important artists of the avant-garde Dada movement, which disregarded logic and reason and promoted irrationality and nonsensical art. The connection to experimental film is obvious, and he dipped his toes into the medium with anemic cinema in 1926. It's a six-minute black-and-white film made up of hypnotic swirling circles and spirals and is quite eye-catching. Man Ray was another famous Dada artist who dabbled in film, starting with Return to Reason in 1923. The short made use of Man Ray's signature rayographs, which were made without a camera by placing objects directly on photographic paper before exposing it to light. It begins with completely abstract, fast-moving images that look to me like they inspired Stan Brakhage, a filmmaker I'll discuss later in this video. Other noteworthy works from this era are René Claire's Entracte and Ballet Mécanique from Dudley Murphy and Cubist painter Fernand Leger. These artists led the way for American director Maya Darren, although her work was much different as she specifically rejected European surrealism. She was active in the 1940s and 50s and was the foremost experimental filmmaker of the 40s. Her most renowned film was Meshes of the Afternoon from 1943. Meshes abandons narrative and traditional concepts of causality and instead aims to give the viewer a dream or trance-like feeling with techniques like double exposure, slow motion, and false eyeline matches. It presents the haunting hooded figure whose face is a mirror, and this makes for a striking, unforgettable image. Meshes of the Afternoon is easily one of the most seminal experimental films ever made, and her experiments with tying causality and identity strongly affected directors like David Lynch. A massive figure in the world of experimental film is Stan Brakhage. In a way, he is fundamentally different from the other experimental filmmakers of the past and his era. Stuff like Unshen Andalu and Meshes of the Afternoon disregarded logic and causality, but still centered on people and recognizable objects. Brackage finally took cinema into a world of complete abstraction, with shorts like Moth Light from 1963 that are an incomprehensible blur. He called his films visual music, and often bypassed the camera entirely by painting or scratching the film itself, or even taping moths to it. Many earlier experimental directors like Boonwell and Darren were influenced by surrealism, but Brackage's work has more in common with non-representational abstract expressionist painters like Jackson Pollock. His films are easy to get into in some ways, as they are often quite short, visually stimulating, and don't require your full attention from beginning to end. One person I have to mention is director David Lynch, although some of his films don't qualify as experimental to me, like Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart. However, works like Eraserhead, Mulholland Drive, and especially Inland Empire are so far from traditional storytelling that they have to be discussed. Blue Velvet is a logical introduction to Lynch as it gives you a taste of the weirdness in a relatively straightforward package. But his masterpieces are Eraserhead and Mulholland Drive, as well as the Showtime series Twin Peaks The Return. His work is often dreamlike and surreal. Lynch's films can defy logic and sometimes depict the supernatural in characters inexplicably switching identities. 
Lynch has been momentous in cinema, even inspiring all-time greats like the celebrated director Stanley Kubrick, who at one point said that Lynch's debut Eraserhead was his favorite film and even played it for the cast and crew of The Shining to set the mood. Lynch's imagery in Eraserhead also motivated H.R. Geiger's designs for the original Alien film from 1979. Another experimental film that's not only appropriate for novices, but also very critical to film history, is the modernist masterpiece A Man with a Movie Camera from 1929, directed by Russian Ziga Vertov. It's similar to Koyana Skatsi in that it has no dialogue or traditional plot and blurs the line of what is considered a documentary. Vertov's film utilizes all sorts of special effects and cinematic techniques, like multiple exposures, split screens, stop motion animation, and reverse footage. It even has a strong metafictional element as it shows the filming and editing of the film itself. Man with a movie camera can be viewed in its entirety on YouTube. There's also a rich history of experimental animation that includes many works that are suitable for beginners. Among the earliest is Rhythmus 21 from Hans Richter, a three minute abstract black and white short from 1921 that consists solely of rectangles growing, shrinking, and moving across the screen. New Zealand artist Len Lai came to prominence in the 1930s, and a great place to start with him is the trippy four minute long rainbow dance. It consists of over the top garish animation that looks great, especially for something from the mid 1930s. It was an early instance of a technique known as rotoscoping, where the animation was placed over pre-existing live action footage. The animation of Oscar Fischinger was more refined, with his most notable work being the very accessible motion painting number one. It's abstract and set to the music of Bach. The 11 minute short showcases some vibrant, intricate animation and was made by painstakingly putting oil paints on glass taking a lengthy nine months to create. There was a considerably lively scene of experimental animation in Eastern Europe in the 1950s and 60s, especially in countries such as Poland, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia. These films were usually short, crude, and often humorous. A good example is Polish director Jan Lenica's A, where a large anthropomorphic letter A inexplicably terrorizes a writer. These artists also used stop motion as seen in Renaissance from Valerian Borovchik. Czech animator Jan Svankmeyer started in this era, but gained more recognition with his features starting in the late 1980s. His first feature, Alice, combined live action and stop motion for a dark adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. There are also many experimental filmmakers that aren't as easily digestible, but are still crucial to know for their influence or place in cinematic history. A perfect case is one of the biggest artists of the 20th century, Andy Warhol. His films are much more of what you might stereotypically think of as an experimental film. They are often incredibly tedious, with the most famous one being Empire from 1964, an eight and a half hour static shot of the Empire State Building. Similarly, his film Sleep was nothing more than over five hours of a man sleeping. His cinematic works are often seen as explorations of boredom, but they weren't meant to keep the viewer's full attention and are more analogous to a video installation you might see in an art museum. Warhol himself even stated audience members could come and go at any time and encourage them to talk or do other things while watching. A somewhat more entertaining one from Warhol is his 1966 film Chelsea Girls, which is extremely unusual in that it consists of two separate 16 millimeter prints projected on different screens playing simultaneously. Warhol was a key precursor to the seminal experimental movement structural film from the 1960s and 70s. Structural film is a prime exemplification of formalism in art, which means it focused on technique and stylistic aspects over narrative. Structural film called attention to the medium of film itself it was rarely concerned with anything remotely resembling a story. The most acclaimed work of structural film is Michael Snow's Wavelength, which consisted of a slow zoom in a mostly empty room for 45 minutes. Obviously, like with Warhol's films, this may seem pointless, but it was nonetheless highly celebrated among avant-garde filmmakers. Snow explored another basic aspect of cinema in the dizzying back and forth, this time the pan instead of the zoom. Like wavelength, the action that does occur is mundane, but the pans reach intense speeds that turn the image into an amorphous blur. 
Another preeminent structural filmmaker was Hollis Frampton, whose 1969 short Lemon consisted of literally just a static shot of a lemon, with the only change being a slowly moving light source. Structural film featured some crossover with the Fluxus art movement, with an example being Mieko Shiomi's Disappearing Music for Face. This short film is nothing more than a smile fading at 2,000 frames per second, which leads to movement so slow that it's basically imperceptible. Some other significant structural directors are Tony Conrad, Ernie Gare, and Paul Sheritz. This general era was also the heyday of Kenneth Anger, who was one of the earliest openly homosexual directors in the U.S., and his films often presented gay themes. His most important films include Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome from 1954 and Scorpio Rising from 1963. While I said this video wouldn't be about art house filmmakers, I would like to suggest a few films from these directors that featured heavy usage of experimental elements, like Weekend from Jean-Luc Godard, Persona from Ingmar Bergman, Playtime from Jacques Tati, and the early work of Russian director Sergei Eisenstein. Finally, some other filmmakers I will just briefly mention in case you want to go further are Jonas Mekis, Jean Cocteau, the brothers Quay, Bruce Connor, and Guy Madden. Of course, experimental film is a huge umbrella, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of experimental filmmakers out there, and there's no way I could even come close to naming everyone. If there's anyone you think people should also know about, please let me know in the comments. That'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe. Okay, so lots of interesting films and filmmakers to explore on your own. I see some uh, comments here, <laughs> some, some of the comments about Chad's and getting them together with the Brad's and the Karen's. Uh, and then uh, Gabe talks about, I, I think the, the film that was mentioned and uh, says this, uh, there was also a great film that uses just about every editing t technique there is, including animation, if anyone's interested in this brilliant film. And then uh, he gives a link to it and then, uh, much earlier, somebody said reminds, uh, I think it was Rodney who said reminds of a Gandhi movie, but in another state, Gods Must Be Crazy is another film of experiment, uh, experimental. And then uh, Gabe says, if I can make an Oscar winning uh, film of a static lemon, I'm on my way to the big money, <laughs> right? That's an excellent point. Okay, one last uh, video for you. This one should be a little, it's quicker video and a little more to the point. It's talking about surrealism and David Lynch. Since the dawn of cinema, filmmakers have utilized their talents to make moving pieces of art that tell stories. They use creative detail, lighting, and images that help set the tone for what a movie is going to entail. But there is one genre of filmmaking, one style that is mostly overlooked because of its nonlinear storytelling technique, and that is surrealism. Surrealism is a 20th century avant-garde movement in art and literature that sought to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind, meaning strange images and shapes come together to tell a story, either through books, paintings, or more recently films. Of all the famous surrealist artists, the most famous is Salvador Dali. Dali's paintings are world famous because of the strange dreamlike images that seem to tell thousands of different stories just by one still image. Sigmund Freud, a psychoanalyst, philosopher, and psychiatrist, frequently studied the nature of dreams and the unconscious mind that liberated imagination. Dali believed in the same principles. Dali once said, that the only difference between a madman and me, I am not mad. While Dolly was famous for stretching out the imagination through his paintings, once cinema was born, all of these artists were given a new medium to experiment with. Dolly made a famous surrealist film called Un Chien Andalou, which in English translates to the Andalusian dog. The film doesn't really have a plot, 
of any kind, but characters interact with each other and bizarre things happen to them. The most famous scene concerns itself with the main character as her eyeball is sliced open with a straight razor. Director Luis Bunel and Salvador Dali later chimed in that most of this film was based on dreams that both men had during their lives. That one shot of the lady's eyeball is one of the most disturbing and analyzed scenes in movie history. Of course, out of all the famous surrealists in cinema, none have been more famous than David Lynch. David Lynch is an American filmmaker who has always gone against the Hollywood grain. His films are purely an art form with multiple layers and meanings. Like paintings, his films can be analyzed and looked at in various ways. And because of the strangeness of his films, most critics regard him as being one of the most creative directors in Hollywood. Most of Lynch's films deal with the surreal style of filmmaking, but four movies stand out as being pure art forms. The first being Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive is one of Lynch's most celebrated films because of its uniqueness and its sheer brilliance on the Hollywood dream. The movie itself is a neo-noirish nightmare on the corruption of Hollywood dreams. It deals with strange characters and oddly put together scenes as the main character Betty Helms, played by Naomi Watts, who has a lesbian relationship with an amnesiac woman, all set against the backdrop of Hollywood. The film deals with dreams and nightmares and its conclusion is equally horrifying. Moving on to another David Lynch classic is the film Lost Highway, which stars Bill Pullman as a mechanic who brutally murders his wife. He starts leading a new life and the movie deals with the neo-noir elements as well as psychological horror. The strange mystery man that appears throughout the film is never explained, but his constant presence in the film is a surreal way of showing the main character's psychological struggle. The film received critical acclaim, but also had its detractors as they felt the film was too confusing, bizarre, and morbid. Of course, one of Lynch's best films and most disturbing films is Blue Velvet. She wore blue Starring Kyle MacLachlan as a man who returns to his hometown, only to discover a severed ear in a field, which leads him to an investigation of a nightclub singer and a group of psychopathic criminals who have kidnapped her child. The film's imagery is bizarre, and the main criminal, played by Dennis Hopper, is completely despicable. He sucks on air from a gas mask before he rapes the nightclub singer, and the main character watches through the shutters of the closet. The film deals with psychological horror as well as surreal themes and images that confuses the audience. The film earned David Lynch an Academy Award nomination for directing and is widely considered to be one of the best films of the 1980s. Of course, out of all of David Lynch's surreal style films, one stands above all, and that is his very first full-length feature, Eraserhead. Eraserhead is a low-budget black and white horror film that deals with creatures, dreams, bizarre sexual frustrations, and alien babies. To this day, critics, fans, and myself included, have no clue what this film is about. It's just a bunch of characters and images thrown together in a weirdly edited way that tell a story that can take on hundreds of different meanings. The film is frightening, disturbing, and is still the weirdest film that I have ever seen in my career. And for that, it is brilliant. Eraserhead is widely considered to be one of David Lynch's best films. And since its release, it has garnered a massive cult following, from the alien baby to the woman who lives in the apartment radiator. 
Eraserhead is the ultimate surrealist film and pays homage to the old Salvador Dali films and paintings of its time. Surrealism is fascinating. From the bizarre images to their multiple meanings, film has been a great medium for artists to explore their expressions of dreams, reality, and nightmarish fantasies. And for David Lynch, the most celebrated surrealist filmmaker, he has given us some amazing films to look at, ponder, and be disturbed by. After all, art is merely an expression of the mind. And if you look at the films of David Lynch, you are opening a door into the mind of a genius. Okay. Um, so, Lots and lots of interesting ideas, concepts, scenes, films talked about in the article and the videos. And hopefully um, they'll give you some inspiration for the project that you're working on. Now I wanted to ask you guys a question. Uh, let's see, let me look at the quote here. It says, now I know why I never liked David Lynch's film. I've never liked Dolly's art. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you know, I have to agree with the guy who's narrating this last film. I, when I saw Eraserhead, that is definitely the weirdest film I've ever seen. If you want to go see the weirdest film you'll ever see, go watch Eraserhead. Um, anyway, uh, so we're working on this project and I want you guys to be inspired. I want you to know what some of the different techniques and uh, you know genres of this type of filmmaking are so you can make uh, something fun and interesting. Uh, now, the question I have for you guys is we have to set a deadline for this project because uh, of course deadlines you know give you something to work towards and we can get it all finished up. So I wanted to see uh, if, you know, what kind of timeline would work for you guys. So I was thinking of, you know, throwing out the idea of maybe a couple of weeks. Do you guys feel like uh, two weeks from today would be a good amount of time to do the, uh, to finish the project? Uh, what's your feedback? I like two weeks. You like two weeks? Yeah. Now, sounds good. I'm going for two weeks too. Okay. Two weeks sounds good, yeah. And Gabe says, if we still have a world by then. Okay, so this is what it's gonna be, either two weeks or the last day on earth, whichever comes first, all right? Um, all right, so that's gonna be Monday the 16th um, will be the deadline for this film uh, or this After Effects project, I should say. And, um, you know, like I said, hopefully you guys have found some different things to inspire you along the way. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to give you guys the rest of the period to work on your projects. You now have a deadline uh, and you can start working on them. I'm, I'm going to turn off my video, but I'll be here if you have a question or want to bounce anything off of me. And then I'll check back with you before the end of the period. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys.
Okay, just checking back in with you guys to see how you're doing. See if anybody has any questions. How's it going?